when, after our children were born, my wife, for a decorating piece on one of our walls, she went up to a Christian bookstore and uh, ordered these plaques with each of our names on them. So it had the name on top, and then the meaning of the name. Do you know the meaning of your name? And then it had a Bible verse for that meaning. And so mine was Douglas, and the meaning, seeker of light. And then a Bible verse, I forget what it was, but something about Jesus, the light of the world, or something like that. Well, so that, was, that filled a little bit part of our wall in our house uh, in, uh, in Port Huron. We lived before we moved here. And I looked up the real meaning of my name. Douglas, dweller of dark places. <laughs> but obviously that wasn't going to sell too many uh, plaques at a Christian bookstore. So, and maybe their hope was that everyone who's a dweller of dark places would eventually be a seeker of light. But do you know your name and what it means? In the Old Testament, uh, the community of faith had a way of, of naming their children. They would name their children in such a way that they wanted their children to live up to the name they gave them. And so the names are often prophetic uh, with regards to the children. When it comes to the names of God, uh, we don't come up with names for God. God gave us different names for himself. Uh, no one name can encapsulate all the different facets of God. So there are many, many, many names of God. Uh, this summer we're going to park on uh, nine of those names in the next uh, eight weeks after this, just looking at the different, different uh, ways of looking at God and his names so that we might know God better through his names. We want to look at one today called El Olam, the everlasting God. You may want to join me in your Bibles in Psalm 90, the everlasting God. Uh, I, the, the series is called Yahweh, and sometimes you'll hear that as the tetragrammaton. In other words, four consonants in the Hebrew language. And for many, those consonants referred to a God, but it was a name for God that was so highly respected and revered that when people were reading it in the text, they would get to that name and they would either skip over it or else they would substitute in another name for God. They had such a high view of God. I mentioned last week in a little bit of a teaser for this message today that we find that God is both transcendent and imminent. Those are words we don't often use. They're theological words uh, that, that refer to God. By his transcendence, it means that he's great, he's high and lifted up, He's holy, holy, holy. The whole earth is full of, his, full of his glory. He was and is and is to come. And so that holy, holy, holy just means uh, that three times it says he's separate. He's far removed. He's transcendent. He's otherly. He's great. He's lofty. But he's also imminent. By imminent, it's a theological word that means he's here that he, he understands our needs, he hears our prayers, he knows the hairs of our head. The difficulty in, in practice is that people will grab one of those at the exclusion of the other. Well, some will say we have a, a great God, but he doesn't know me. And others will say we've got a God who lives next door, but he's not powerful enough to change a world. And so, and then there are some who say, well, I'd like to take a little of both, and I have a balanced approach. If balance is a little of both, we've got a distorted approach, that we need to have a God who is altogether transcendent and a God who is altogether imminent. He is an everlasting God. Psalm 90 was written by Moses. Uh, the Psalms were put together around the year uh, 1000. When you think of 1000 BC, you think of King David, and many of those Psalms were from King David. Well, Moses preceded David by centuries, and we have one Psalm that was written by Moses. Uh, the language, the vocabulary, the style, all is from a different era. And you remember Moses was the individual who God had tapped on the shoulder and said, I want you to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. 
The, the children of Israel, God's chosen people, had been there now for centuries. And it was time for them to go back to the land, the promised land that God had given and promised to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. It was part of that promise we looked at when we looked at the, um, the gospel mosaic. And so God said to Moses, you're the guy, Exodus chapter 3, uh, you're going to lead my people out. And it's interesting because we see an everlasting God, El Olam. Let's read it in Psalm 90. Psalm 90, we learn three things here. First of all, we learn from our, in our brief lives that we can suffer, discover significance when we dwell in an everlasting God. Verse, verse 1 and 2. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, wherever you have formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. That's the word there, Olam. You are El Olam, the everlasting God. You have no beginning, you have no end, and therefore you are our dwelling place. Moses said that, representing a group of people who had no earthly dwelling place. They were living in the land of Egypt as uh, slave tenants. They didn't want to be there. It wasn't their home. And so Moses is saying to him, Lord, you have been our dwelling place. And God was their dwelling place when he, he broke the, the, the grip of Pharaoh through the ten plagues. God was their dwelling place. When the children of Israel left the land, and they were really literally caught between a rock and a hard place, the, the Red Sea on one hand, and the pursuing uh, Egyptian army on the other, and God was their dwelling place as he opened up the Red Sea, and they, they continued on in their journey. God led them. He was their dwelling place. He led them to the brink of the promised land where they would have a home. But because of their disobedience, they weren't allowed to go in. And again, they wandered in the wilderness for almost four decades without a home. But God was their dwelling place. Is God your dwelling place? For every homeless soul, there's a God who wants to be your dwelling place. I was talking to Eric Cheever before the service. Eric's over here. Eric, stand up. 11 years today, cancer-free. So we're very, very thankful, Eric. Yeah, praise God. God had become Eric's dwelling place many, many years ago. And when cancer hit, I remember when that happened. And then the treatments and all the rest of it, and then um, cancer-free. For those of us living in a very transient, uncertain world, we need a dwelling place, an everlasting God, an everlasting God. To me, it's interesting when I read this, where God says to us, I will be your dwelling place. But in the New Testament, there's a twist to that. Because in the New Testament, he says, you will be my dwelling place. Where God says, we're not we're our own, we're bought with a price, therefore glorify God in our bodies and our spirits, which are God's, and the Holy Spirit comes to live with us. God is not confined in a human body, and yet the Holy Spirit comes to live in the human body of everyone who has chosen to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And so, he first, so first of all, he says, I will be your dwelling place, and you will be my dwelling place. It was this week that Elizabeth Elliot died. Many of you know that name. Elizabeth Elliot was married to Jim Elliot. Uh, they went as missionaries, bright, young, smart people, uh, married and uh, went off with other missionaries to Ecuador in, in the mid-1950s. But it was January or July 6, or January 6, uh, 1956, that five missionaries lost their lives in a riverbank, um, uh, martyred, massacred uh, by the Aka Indian tribe. Uh, it was Jim Elliott who said so many famous things as a very young man. One of the things he says, said was, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep in order to gain what he cannot lose. He gave up his life for a cause. It was his wife, Elizabeth Elliott, who went back to Ecuador and ministered to those Indians for many years. It was, and, and she 
said so many brilliant things as well. But one of them was this. And she says, the secret of it all is Christ in me and not the changing of my circumstances. Folks, that's the secret. That an everlasting God becomes our dwelling place and we become his dwelling place. I thought a lot about the everlasting God this week. And how does an everlasting God who transcends time, who was before the beginning and has no end, uh, how does he relate to the events of our world? And how does he, prevent, uh, how does, how does he uh, even uh, deal with the uh, Supreme Court ruling that came down on Friday? Now, how does our church respond to that? And I, I tried to put some of my thoughts into a blog, and I want to share a little bit of that with you today, because it's very, very important. Uh, I've seen Christians that have responded in different ways. Um, let me explain, I think, four things. And these aren't, folks, these aren't my opinions. You'd, my opinion is not any better than anyone else's, and I recognize even this morning that on these topics we all perhaps have different opinions. But my task and my calling from God is to share the revelation of an everlasting God and try to bring that, that revelation uh, in a way that makes sense to our times. The first thing I believe that is so important that we do is that we're grounded in biblical truth. That we're grounded in biblical truth. When I, I read the scriptures, let me just share a little bit of what I've written. While the ruling has essentially changed the definition of marriage in America, God's definition has not changed. Every Christian will have to decide if his or her values will be shaped by the changing views of a culture or by an unchanging God. For many evangelicals, the Bible is a sole authority for faith and practice, and this commitment is based on the self-proclamation of the scriptures. For it says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for the instruction in righteousness, that the man of God and woman of God might be perfect, a competent, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Uh, the psalmist wrote, quoting God, he says, I've magnified my word even above my name. Psalm 138 and verse 2. And then this everlasting God and his word that is true for all time, and in a book that's relevant for all time. Uh, it says, uh, in fact, Psalm 119, verse 89, thy word, O Lord, is forever settled in heaven. And so folks, we don't, I don't have the option of cutting and pasting the word of God. My option is, only option if I know God, is to read it, to know it, to live it, and to teach it. And so um, that is our commitment. While the law has changed, our commitment to the Bible has not. Uh, we want to be grounded in this word with all humility grounded in this book. Secondly, we need to pray. Many Christians are responding in panic and in anger. And we're reminded uh, by the Lord, that the Lord hasn't promised a perfect place for ministry. I don't know where that perfect place would be. Hawaii? Um, <laughs> Uh, but God has trusted us with ministry at this place and at this time, and I trust him. The, the perfect place is yet to come. And it's not like this has never happened before. The first century church was born into the context of persecution. Not only did it survive, but in the ensuing centuries, God used that church to turn a world upside down. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, Paul writes Timothy, and he says, first of all then, and the, the meaning there is priority. First of all in priority, I urge you that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and it is pleasing the sight of God our Savior who desires all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. I hear all the time from people, well, we have to do more than pray. And well, I, don't, I don't discard that at all. There's truth to that. The fact of the matter is prayer has to be the priority. It has to be continual. It has to be sustaining. And it has to be complete. 
Our God is sovereign and in control. Ultimately, what we want to see and change lives in a righteous nation, only God can do. Our church leadership has followed the recommendations for our, our statement of faith and all of the different related documents. and We've done that over the last 14 or 15 months. And this is uh, not the end, I think it's the beginning of cultural uh, wars that will rage on. And our responsibility is, first of all, to pray. The Old Testament, there's a challenge and it says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, will forgive their sins and heal their land. So folks, the, the word there is pray. Third, we have to be focused on mission. While a ruling came down on Friday, that didn't change our mission. And our mission as a church goes all the way back to the words of Jesus in Acts chapter 1, where he says, and, and go and, and make disciples. Uh, make disciples, Matthew chapter 28, Acts chapter 1, he says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and at the ends of the earth. So that's our mission, to take the gospel of Christ to our world. And we have to do it with clarity, we have to do it with boldness and courage, and we have to do it with love. Um, some of the responses I've seen, I, I'm in, I am seeing, are, are counterintuitive to that. Uh, for churches who cave into the culture, um, they're putting themselves in a, a position where they're not going to be able to minister to the culture. A church that caves in loses its message. And yet a church and individuals who respond in rabid ways, yelling and screaming and name-calling and anger, um, they've lost an audience. And we have to be salt and light in our world. This is no time to hide the gospel under a bushel basket, or nor, nor is it any time for Christians to hide under a bushel basket. Folks, this is our time. This is not a time to be discouraged and, and get all upset and say, I wish it were different. This is our time uh, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Like no other time will our message be more distinctive in our lifetime than right now. So uh, while I, I, I can't say I'm happy, about what happened this week, I am excited about the mission that we have before us to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to our world. I want to say number four, and that we, was we must demonstrate the love of Christ. Uh, we must demonstrate the love of Christ. Jesus showed us that while we're not to love the world or the ways of the world, we're to love people. We have to love people, not just the ones who agree with us or live like us. Jesus taught it, and he modeled it. Ed Stetzer, a church uh, consultant and church expert, um, said this week, you cannot hate a people and reach a people at the same time. And this is one of the challenging things I think we have in our world today. The, the world has, in the media in particular, has um, determined that if you don't agree with somebody, you hate them. Um, I don't see that anywhere. Um, we, you'd probably disagree with me on a lot of things, and maybe I would with you, but we still love each other. Because that's the modeling of Jesus. We have to love each other. We have to realize that every person in this world, no matter what he or she thinks or believes, uh, was loved so much by Jesus that he died for him. And so, this is our challenge, and that has to also be the essence of our prayers that God makes us and shapes us to love our world, the people in our world, as Jesus does. So when I think of a, an everlasting God who is looking at our segment of history and has strategically placed us, you and me, uh, gathered together in this thing called Woodside, at this moment of time, he's trusting us with a mission field he's placed us in, and he's trusting us with a gospel that's so valuable. It's water to a dying world. And we have the opportunity to share it. What a privilege. What a responsibility. The everlasting God. El Olam. But Moses goes on in the next few verses and develops a contrast from an everlasting God to the brevity of humanity. 
Let me just read uh, verses uh, 3 through 11, and we'll make just a couple of comments on some of these verses. He says, you return man to dust and say, return, O children of man. He knows our beginning day and he determines our ending day. For a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past, or as a watch in the night. You sweep them away as with a flood, and they are like a dream. Like grass that is renewed in the morning, in the morning it flourishes, and is renewed in the evening, it fades and withers. For we are brought to an end by your anger, and by your wrath we are dismayed. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. For all our days pass away under your wrath. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. The years of our life are 70, or even by reason of strength, 80. Yet their span is but toil and trouble, yet they are soon gone and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you? It, very simply, he's saying, a God is from everlasting to everlasting. But man has a beginning point, but no end point. Once man enters a, in the world, every one of us had a birthday. Some of you are selling, celebrating that birthday today. And you entered the world on this day several years ago, maybe many years ago. The moment you enter into the world, you live forever. You live on into eternity. And, and God's intention, when, you, when we, we read the early chapters of Genesis, was that man would live like that without ever having to die, physically die. But because of sin, uh, the fall, man began to die. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And so there's this segment from birth to death is this in the segment in between. He says it's so brief. And then he says beyond the death experience is life. And Jesus said it very simply. He says there's a broad road that leads to destruction, and many find it. And there's a narrow road that leads to life everlasting, and few find it. But everybody who's born is going to live for eternity somewhere in one of those two places, either in the presence of God or away from God, the presence of God in torment. This segment determines eternity, how we live this life. He said, but it's so brief. He says, it's like a dream. Um, it's like, a, it's like a, a tale that's told, a story. It's over like that. He says, a thousand years is like a watch in the night to God. A watch in the night, depending on what culture you're in, was either a three-hour time period or a four-hour time period. Now, assuming most of you slept well last night, let me ask you, how was it from two to five in the morning, that three-hour time period? And for most of you, he said it was like that. I took my wife to the airport at four, four this morning, so it was a little longer for me. <laughs> but you know, you know what I'm saying? A thousand years to God, it's like a watch in the night. So while he's everlasting, man is in this little segment, and this little segment of time goes by just like that. And, and God is also saying, Moses is saying, and God, you know all about us in this segment. You know our secret sins. Those sins that you and I try to manage that no one else knows about, guess who does? An everlasting God. He goes on to say, verses that we like to skim over, where it talks about the anger and the fury of God. Notice verse number 11. Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you? We're all supposed to fear God. But what does that word fear mean? A pastor friend of mine described it like this. He says, if you know God, fear means awe and respect. If you don't know God, fear means fear. That one day we'll stand before a God who is a consuming fire. And so we in this segment of time have to know and understand that this is not about us. Even the smartest of men is, uh, is puny to an everlasting God. 
And so we don't define God. Can you imagine somebody in this little segment of time say, I don't think God exists. Oh, really? Uh, based on what knowledge? Based on whose knowledge? Based on, based on what? An everlasting God defines us and gives us meaning. And so he, and he invites us, come dwell in me. Come dwell in me. Moses closes with a prayer. Um, let me read this prayer uh, and make a comment just on verse 12. So teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. How many of us are trying to navigate this little segment of time, making decisions that are wise, um, not trying to make mistakes that have long-term consequences, and all the time we're thinking, God, how do we do this? How do we find meaning for our segment? How do we make a difference in our world? And what Moses is saying is, because I'm finite and you're not, you're an everlasting God, Lord, you teach me to number my days. Moses is not asking God to help him count his days. He's asking God to help him make his days count. And isn't that what we want? We want to make our days count. And so we need divine interpretation and direction for that. He says, return, O Lord, how long? Have pity on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you've afflicted us, for as many years as we have seen evil. I think of that. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love. Moses is not asking God to change his circumstances. Moses is asking God to overwhelm him every morning with God's hesed, his steadfast love. And if that were to happen in our lives, can you imagine how that would change our day? That every morning, maybe even before we get out of bed, we're just... We're lying there in bed and just say, Lord, you're everlasting, I'm not. I got a day ahead of me that uh, some of it's going to be fun and some of it I just dread. Lord, would you satisfy me this, this moment with your steadfast love? Overwhelm me with your loving kindness and just flow over me and through me a sense of your presence and your love. And Lord, whatever this day brings, may I represent you well, because this segment is short, and you're eternal. Verses 16 and 17, I've prayed for, um, I can't tell, I don't know how many times I've prayed these words for myself and for Woodside Bible. Let me pray them again this morning. Let your work be shown to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Early this morning, I prayed. And my prayer is very simple. God, you're everlasting. Before the mountains were, you were there. And God, you've placed me here at this time with this church. And I'm so far over my head, Lord. You know that. Um, don't let the people know it yet. <laughs> I'm so far over my head. But I say, God, establish the work of my hands. May what we do at Woodside Bible make an eternal difference for you. May you use us to be your hands and feet. Would you reshape us to love like Jesus loved, to make a difference in our world for an everlasting God? That's my prayer. Would you pray that prayer for your life and for your church? 
that God's hand of blessing would be upon all that he's asked us to do and that we would do it well for his glory.